David, thank you very much for the introduction. And can you hear me? Should I? OK. And uh, thank you also for the invitation. I think it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Eugene. And I already like it very much. And sorry that I interrupt your weekend. That was not the intention. But couldn't find a, any other date. So I want to talk a little bit about how we uh, envision green building design and what it means. Not like this. This is in Boston. but And then I, w I was supposed to speak at a conference in San Francisco on, uh, mon on Tuesday. No, on Wednesday, actually. Last Wednesday. And then the cloud happened. So this is a cloud we did in Frankfurt Fair a couple of years ago. I called it Transolar Cloud Design. And this is the volcano cloud design, which was the reason why I couldn't come to San Francisco on Wednesday. But this uh, we found on the internet, which I found interesting. The red triangle here shows uh, CO2 emissions per day for all air traffic within Europe. And this is the volcano emission per day. So this is what we have saved. So <laughs> then, <laughs> so it was not too bad. <laughs> and we did this symposium then via webcast. And it worked out really well. And I thought, one can, what could do this more often? It's actually not too bad. So this is our office in Stuttgart. And this is a little bit about what we are doing. Uh, David mentioned it already. Transola was founded in 92. We have about 40 employees. I think, meanwhile, it's a little more. And our main scope is that we develop energy and climate concepts and daylight concepts for buildings. And we do the modeling. So fluid dynamics, thermal modeling, daylight modeling. And then also we are part of a developer team for a thermal simulation software called Transis. And once in a while, we are working in the education of architects and engineers. I think this is basically what we are doing here. Are some projects, I think uh, David has mentioned most of them. I think talking a little bit about the Nord Bay building, I think what I found interesting in this building was that this was basically the only headquarter of a, of a German bank which had been built over the last 20, 30 years without air conditioning. So it's a, and people are always very, uh, let's say, almost excited, almost shocked when I say this in the US. It's not so unusual in Germany to have commercial buildings without any air conditioning, but it's unusual for a headquarter of a bank building. I think this was really exciting. Later on, I'm gonna, show a little bit the Winnipeg project we just finished. Going back in history a little bit, this is an image we found in a magazine showing uh, Manhattan in 1920. And what is interesting, what you see is that at the Flatiron building, every single window has external shading. Every window is operable for natural ventilation. Floor depth is limited so that people have access to the facade. And I don't want to say that it was comfortable. I had been in New York City when they had 100 degrees and super humid. And it was probably almost unbearable in these buildings. But Carrier invented air conditioning in the 20s. So none of these buildings had air conditioning. And I think designers knew really well how to design buildings to make the best out of the situation. And suddenly, we got air conditioning and we got curtain wall, which made these buildings happen. And they don't provide any better environmental conditions. They have 72 degrees in summer. Some of them might have 68, but the glass of this building is coated to the extent that you don't see true colors anymore. The green is probably brownish. The water is greenish. <coughs> and you're ex you can't open a window. You, don't, you don't, probably don't even get much daylight through this glass. So we. We, what the thing we missed is we can provide 72 degrees whenever you want to the extent that we do this when we have 100 outside and people freeze to death. Isn't it weird that people in the US take their sweater to work in summer, not in winter? I think this is just wrong. And, uh, but we, we don't provide better environmental conditions. And then talking a little bit about sustainability, I really like this image from a magazine. 
where they say, welcome to breathtaking Tokyo Water Park, where you can wash away the pressure and stress of the overcrowded city. But I think this has a lot to do with uh, sustainability. In many discussions we had with David and his partners at Danish, we talked about the metrics of how we evaluate sustainability. And when we think about sustainability, we always think in ec environmental issues, and we always think in kilowatt hours per square meter in year, or kilo BDU per square foot. But we never think about kilowatt hours per person. What does it mean per person? In this facility, it doesn't matter how much energy they use per person, it's negligible. And this is something we miss. And if, we, if the architectural quality is not right, the building is a waste, no matter how efficient it is. So architectural quality, the quality of the space, is probably the biggest, the most important metric of sustainability. And this is the one which is not quantifiable, and therefore you can't integrate it in any sustainable rating systems. This is why we will never ever have a holistic rating system. And puts a question on the rating systems overall. This is why we prepared this image, where we said this has a lot to do with US green building design. You take a hammer and you put a grass roof on it, some PV cells, a windmill, you collect the water for cleaning, a bicycle rack, and then you put it on a bus stop because the thing can't drive anymore. <laughs> and then you achieve lead gold, but nobody questioned the system, the thing, the hammer. And I think this is what happened, and I, I don't want to blame the US GBC. I think the US GBC was extremely successful. Now everywhere in the world, people apply these rating systems, and I think they created a momentum, momentum on people thinking about sustainability. But it's time to think about the thing. And I think we need to move up the bar. I think this is what we need to do. We worked with Foster on the development of Master City. We did the energy concept for this development. And one, one can certainly question whether anybody needs this, this city. I think we are successful when we think about uh, carbon neutral San Francisco or carbon neutral Portland or Eugene, but who needs a new city in the middle of nowhere in a climate which is basically unbearable? For us, it was certainly a very interesting research task. So we looked at the climate and how, how can we deal with the climate in, in Abu Dhabi, which is certainly unbearable at certain times a year, but there are also times when it's really nice. But what we found really interesting, the task was that we uh, generate all energy we use in the city on the city site. So no offshore wind farm or anything like this. No trees planted in New Zealand. Everything needed to happen on the site of the city. So all buildings are covered with photovoltaics, with solar application, and you see here on the horizon some windmills. So that was the idea, and we calculated backwards and said, okay, what does it mean for the building? How efficient does buildings need to be so that we can cover it entirely with renewable sources within the city. And this was the final result. And I think this is interesting because what we figured out is that buildings need to be, depend on the type of program, need to be, let's say, between 70 and 85% more efficient compared to what they do today. And I think this is the lesson we have learned. It's not the infrastructure in a city which is going to solve us this carbon issue, the biggest burden is on the building. And this is where we need to be creative about. And it has to do with design. And it has mostly, mainly to do with design. And then when we think about the city, then we figure out this is what we always use when we talk about urban design. There is an interdependency of scale. It's about the city, but it's also about the orientation of the grid, the organization of the block. David knows this diagram really well. It's from Banish, actually. <laughs> but it's also about then the orientation of the building. If the block is not sized right uh, th and the unit doesn't get daylight, it doesn't work for the unit itself. And then even the facade needs to work with this, within this uh, interdependency of scale idea. So we need to be su successful on every single step, on every single scale. 
in order to create really nice environments, good environments, and also efficient environments. At the end of the day, it's always about the people, and we do buildings and places for people. So this is a project I want to show you. We work together with uh, Sauerbrook Cotton. It's in Frankfurt, and they just finished it. They just moved into the building. And this was, uh, give me a second. This, we have this, uh, again, talking about kilowatt hours per square meter in year. We have these rules in Germany how much a building should need. Usually, these high-rise buildings, they use about three, four, or 500 kilowatt hours per square meter in year. There is a, uh, let's say, a guideline, which is called Solar Bau. And this guideline says a building shouldn't, be, shouldn't use more than 100 kilowatt hours per square meter in year. And this was the first high-rise we developed in accordance to the Solar Bau uh, guidelines. But also, the, the client requested to have natural ventilation, which we always promote. And then also, the, he's, he accepted that we exceed 26 degrees in summer, which is 79 Fahrenheit, about 60 hours per year. So these were, let's say, the boundaries for the development. And when we started to work with Sauerbruch, what we figured out that the footprint of the high rise, which you see here, is directly in the axis of uh, the prevailing winds. The wind is either coming from southwest or from northeast, and it's right in this axis. So we said, how can we take advantage of this wind situation? And when you look at over and under pressure you get on a building facade, then you see where the wind comes. You have a zone of overpressure. And at the other end of the building, you have a zone of under pressure. And what it does, it creates cross ventilation through a building. So people keep their window open. And it's not so critical on a really cold day. It's always critical on a day like when you have 60 degrees. Then suddenly, you create a lot of cross ventilation, a lot of air movement inside your building. And you create an unnecessary heating load. So the one consequence is that people say, why don't we close the windows, have no operable windows, and then put in a machine which is really efficient and does the job. That's not the intent. The intent is that we want to give people the ability to interact with the climate. And actually, Berkeley found out that in one case study, looking on productivity, the biggest increase on productivity they achieved in a building where people had an influence on air quality. Now, it was a mechanical system, but what I said, this is nothing else than our old traditional operable window. So this is basically the idea. Wind comes from here. We have a double facade. And the double facade we have mainly to protect the shading against the wind. And then we said we use the double facade, and we control the overpressure zone, the openings, and the openings in the under pressure zone so that we create a ring of constant pressure on the inner facade. What it means, like if we have strong wind, we close the leeward side and open the, the front side so that we pressurize this corridor. And then we get even pressure situation on both sides. So that was the idea. And it, it sounds really complicated. What it means is in winter, when it's cold, it's closed to create a buffer zone. In summer, it's open to dissipate the heat. In the intermediate season, we modulate the flaps so that we even the, the pressure inside. This is about the pressure. Let me jump over this. This is how the building looks like. And now, in here, in these verticals, are the flaps that can open to control the wind and the pressure on the inner facade. Here, it's still a little bit under construction. They just finished up the top of the building. It's a few months ago. Now, this was, let me go back. Like, what you see is the very typical European approach is very narrow buildings. Like, all offices lined up along the facade. Everybody has access to the facade. Now, it's a very different for us working in North America. It's a completely different culture. But also, offices are differently organized. And I don't want to, uh, let's say, quote what's better. We have, in our office, we are work in an open space office environment. And we have sometimes troubles to, let's say, organize and furnish ourselves in these very, very narrow buildings. 
So there are pros and cons for all of it, as long as it is in, within reason or within certain limits. This was a building we also just finished with KPMV from Toronto, KPMV Architects from Toronto. It's in Winnipeg. And it's for Manitoba Hydro, the utility company in Winnipeg. When we started to work on this building, well, first of all, I think we had a very fortunate situation that we could work for a highly educated client. It's a, it's a building full of engineers, but what they did is before they commissioned the design for this building, they toured through North America, they toured through Europe to educate themselves what it means to have an energy efficient, sustainable building. Now, everybody wonders, why does a utility company really want to have such a sustainable building? I think uh, the Canadian uh, utility companies are still public. So the government, the provincial government, dictates them how much they can charge their people for electricity. And Manitoba has the lowest electricity rate worldwide. Now, they sell electricity on a higher rate to the United States. So they want to encourage their own people to save as much energy as they can so that they can sell more to the United States. I think that's, that's the one piece of their business. The other piece is that they buy electricity from the United States at nighttime to pump up their lakes and they sell it back during peak times next day. And they're making good money with it. Like they are building a new dam right now for $4 billion. Seems to be a very profitable business. But don't feel bad. S Switzerland and Austria is doing the same with us. So it's, a, it's an universal thing. So they requested to have a really energy efficient building. And then when we looked, when you started to work on this and we looked at the climate, and sorry that this is matrix, uh, but this is called SI unit. SI stands for Standard International, so <laughs> sorry that I have to say that. <laughs> but I'm going to translate it for you. It's th minus 30 means is about the same in Fahrenheit, and plus 35 is about 90. So this is our outside temperature in Winnipeg. And not only that it's really super cold in winter, it gets warm, hot, and humid in summer, but then they have about half the year, a little less than half the year, they have temperatures below freezing. It's, it's uh, actually sometimes I think, how can people live there? <laughs> and, but the people are super nice. I'm not sure if there is a correlation. This is psychrometric chart showing temperature here, humidity here, and this is summer when it's getting hot and humid. What we did when we talked to the people, they said, yeah, it's cold here and super cold, but it, when it's cold, it's always sunny. And we started to look into this. And we looked at how much solar radiation do we get on a vertical south facade. And then we compared it. So blue is Winnipeg monthly, red is Toronto. And we compared it to Toronto because Canadians consider Toronto always being the mildest climate in Canada. And then yellow would be the maximum achievable. So no clouds all month. So if every day is sunny, this is what they can achieve. And look at their month in March when it's still super cold where they have like 60, 70% of the maximum they can achieve. So we said like this is, this is the biggest benefit they have in this climate. And we have to take advantage of it. So we always said, like, if there is a place to do passive solar design, it's certainly Winnipeg. It's, it's not New Mexico or Arizona. It's Winnipeg. We couldn't find a single cold city worldwide with so many sun hours than Winnipeg has. But we had many debates what the design should be about. And many people in Winnipeg said, we need to have big floor plate. With these cold temperatures, we need to minimize the facade and we always called it the submarine architecture or, or the Pentagon architecture. And then, so people completely disconnected from the outside depending on a machine to survive. And then we said, but the, the indigenous architecture in Winnipeg and the prairie, isn't it the, the teepee? Even though I, I wouldn't want to live there in a teepee with minus 35 degrees. 
So we ended up with this organization of a high-rise building. It's basically a twin tower with one loft facing east and one loft facing west. There is a certain logic to this diagonal because they have these bridges connecting downtown buildings so that in winter people don't need to go to the outside. This bridge is connecting here. This is a public path through the building and all the major bus stops of Winnipeg are here. So there is a certain logic. It also fits perfectly onto the property. But because of this, we gained this winter garden facing due south. Now, there was the debate. KPMB had a very similar design, but rotated 90 degrees so that this bar was facing south and this one was basically facing north, which everybody would consider being an optimum orientation for an office environment, so being either now north or south, so that you don't deal with the low sun angle. But we said, like, if we have a dynamic facade, we can deal with the low sun angles, but you can't really take advantage of passive solar gains if you expose an office to the sun. Because what happens as soon as the sun comes out, people are in trouble with glare, and they pull down their shade to protect themselves against the glare, and there is no solar gain. And we said by doing this atrium facing south, we basically create a buffer zone which becomes, let's say, a non-program space where people can meet. And we can use this as a solar collector for the, for the entire building. So if we could, let me go back. If we cut an artificial cross section through the building which goes through the winter garden, and then through the, through the loft into this north winter garden, we would basically see this organization. Sorry that I need to bother you with these diagrams, but this is a little bit the nature of our work, dealing with these blue and red arrows. And everybody believes that the air is really doing this. Yeah. So, but what, what we do is we have like the air intake unit, like we have these six-story atriums, and then on the north side, it's three-story atriums. So they always looked at this package, this six-story package being one neighborhood. So putting departments into one six-story package, which are related, and then we bring in air through this unit, we heat it up, but we provide it at about 50 degrees. We keep this space at 50 degrees so that when the sun comes out, the sun has some potential to further heat it up. If we would heat up this space at 7 o'clock in the morning to 70 degrees, as soon as the sun comes out, the space overheats. You have to open the window. So then we have some water features to provide humidity, and then we have fan call units that take the air and push it into a raised floor, plenum. But via displacement ventilation, the air comes into the space, and we exhaust it into the north atria. And then in winter, we pull it down put it into the parkade, and there is a heat recovery unit where we take the heat, put it on a hydronic loop, and bring it back to the supply air. I think that's pretty simple. That's the system. And then in addition, we use the ceiling itself. We have piping embedded in the ceiling so that we can use the ceiling for radiant heating and in summer for cooling purposes. We did this the first time in big scale at the Norddeutsche Landesbank building with David. So this is the same principle, just in a three-dimensional sketch. This is the piping in the concrete slab. So it's very simple, plastic piping uh, casted into the, into the slab. Now, we didn't do this image. As I know it looks much nicer. <laughs> it's a firm from New York who did these images. But it shows the same principle. But what you see is that in summer and intermediate season, we take the chimney and we naturally exhaust the building. And we overheat the exhaust air at the top to improve the buoyancy effect. In addition, we have boreholes under the building for geothermal heat exchange. And we provide about 100% cooling and 50% heating for the building. But this is what we really liked is we finally talked the client into a double facade. And it's not that we are dogmatic about double facade. It looks a little bit like it. But the ultimate goal is to do a building without double facade. But still, we are 
looking for the equipment that allows us to give people all, all, all conditions without, with a single facade or the flexibility with a single facade. In this case, the insulated facade is on the outside. This is because of the cold climate conditions. In Germany, we would do it the other way around, having the insulated facade on the inside. But then if there is a single glass on the outside, the single temperature of the single glass in winter goes way below freezing. So if somebody opens the window to the inside and the humid air touches this glass, like you get frost right away. And if the sun doesn't hit this glass, the frost stays until spring. So <laughs> if you don't like somebody, you can open his window. <laughs> and he has no fuel for the next couple of months. <laughs> so we needed to turn it around. We have the insulated facade on the outside, but the inner facade is basically a single glazed partition wall. But they give us the ability to run the Venetian blind in this corridor, so we keep the shading outside the conditioned environment. But even more important, we have, let's say, by the building management system controlled openings in the outer facade, but people can open their window manually whenever they want in the inner facade. And there were many discussions in the beginning, and the facility people from Hydro, they said no, no operable windows in a commercial building in this climate. Like people open their window in winter, and it doesn't even need to be super cold, but they get condensation on the seals. They close it again, the seals freeze together. Next time they open it, the seals are broken. They said this is a maintenance nightmare. We can't do this. And the double facade was finally the only possibility for us to really give people an operable window. And it was actually not that much more expensive than using triple glazed facade, which wouldn't be unusual in this cold climate. We also convinced the client that we can have a summer maximum temperature of 79, which is 26 degrees C. And he was concerned in the beginning, but we prepared this very simple diagram, like the thermal comfort of a person depends on the air temperature, but also on the radiant temperature of the surrounding surfaces. So, and what you usually do here, you have an internal blind, and now if low sun angles on the west facade hits this blind, the blind heats up easily to 100 degrees. And this acts like a radiator for this person. So what he showed is that the operative temperature, which is the temperature this person feels, is basically 26, so it's basically 79. And with the system we propose where we have the shading outside and the radiant cooling, we can have 79 as an air temperature and achieve an actually lower operative temperature for this person. So this, was, this convinced the client that this is appropriate and they were operating this building last summer and we had no issue, no complaints about thermal comfort. Of course, there are complaints in the building. There are always complaints when people move in a big building like this, but not about this. <laughs> this is the South Atrium, and <clears throat> this is basically our air handling unit. And the, the, the actual, the mechanical air handling unit is embedded in this bench. And here you see some nylon strips where water is running down for humidification purposes. In summer, we have a shade running here, a Venetian blind, so that in summer people are not exposed to the sun, but we just open this south winter garden so, so that it becomes an outdoor terrace, basically. It's not air conditioned. It's not air conditioned at all. When the sun comes out, they, tell, they told us that they get 90 degrees inside this in winter, like having minus 20 outside, they get 90 degrees in this winter garden, purely heated by the sun. This is the daylight modeling. I think I, I make it shorter. Where we compromise daylight is around the core. And we have a depth of about thir 36 feet from the facade to the core. So it's deeper than a usual European building but by far not as deep as a usual American building. We finally convinced the client that if they have single offices, like department managers get single offices, that they don't put them on the facade, that they put them at the core, because these are the people 
who spent the least amount of time in their offices. And when they are at the facade, they block the daylight for all people behind. So we said we have to put them at the core. Uh, they did this. The department managers are not so happy about this decision. <laughs> But this shows daylight autonomy in a cross section depending on how far you are away from the facade. But what it shows is like up to a depth of six meters or 18 feet, we have a daylight autonomy of around about 70%. So 70% of the time in this off during office hours, they don't need any artificial light. But also when I think designers have a responsibility on microclimate, on urban issues, not only social issues, but also climate issues. And like this shows a wind modeling we did with the building that shows the downdraft we create at the building. Every structure, every, especially every tall stru structure, creates a downdraft. We try to shape it a little bit more aer aerodynamic. It doesn't help. It makes it better, but you always have a component which is going down. And it's actually not that complicated to deal with. It's just important to think about. It was this canopy which was finally so the solution. So by doing this, we redirect the wind and, uh, let's say, put the problem on the neighbor. <laughs> it's not a real problem for the neighbor. But also, we looked at what at Air Canada Plaza. This is Air Canada Plaza where people spend their outdoor lunch in summertime. And we wanted to avoid that we cast shade with the building on Air Canada Plaza. You see, 1st of April, we still have some shade on Air Canada Plaza. But then 1st of May, sun angles are high enough so that we don't have any shade there. And before 1st of May, you can't be outside in Winnipeg. So that's the energy balance. We are about 60% better than MNECB, which is basically adapted ASHRAE 90.1. And <coughs> But the, these numbers, I think everybody's talking about these numbers, how, much, how many percent they are better. Uh, there is so much cheating going on. You better believe, don't believe anything. This is a rendering. And people cheat not with the proposed building. You always have to compare it to the reference. And like if you adjust, if you think about the design, the reference always says the, the design of the building is the same. So we change the orientation of the building, and then ASHRAE says the orientation of the reference building is the same. So for many design moves we have made, we didn't even get any credit. But also, what we did is that this South Winter Garden, you can, in the reference, you can say this is fully air conditioned. So you create a huge energy consumer you compare yourself with. But we said, like, we do the same comfort conditions. So no air conditioning in summer and heating to 50 degrees in winter, also for the reference building. So there is so much potential for, for cheating so that you shouldn't believe all these numbers. This is the gallery, this public walkway I have talked about below one of the high-rise uh, buildings. And this is an actual, actual picture. This is the solar chimney on the north side of the building. Here you see the double facade, the solar chimney. We put in some pipes. It's facing east and west so that we catch the low sun angles. The, uh, the sun is absorbed on these black pipes so that we transfer the solar radiation into heat to uh, increase the buoyancy effect. This is the north atrium. Again, solar chimney. This is the team in the double facade at the grand opening. It was super hot there. <laughs> we had, I, I think we had 95 degrees in the double facade. Let me show you another building, which is the French school in Damascus, where we work with an, uh, with an office, with an architecture firm from Paris called Atelier Lyon. And when we started to work on this, we did some research on indigenous architecture, because indigenous or vernacular architecture is often driven by uh, climatic aspects. And this is very typical for this region, these arcades and courtyards, and creating nice microclimate conditions in these courtyards. These are actual pictures from Damascus. 
here a courtyard shaded with a fabric where they have a restaurant. People spend really a lot of time outside in Damascus. And Damascus has nice climate conditions because it's on a pretty high elevation. I forgot how high it really is. But it's pretty dry climate. This is a souk in Damascus. And these are the outdoor temperatures. What it basically says is that in summer, from June till September, mid-September, you can have 100 degrees in Damascus. But again, going back, what you see is this huge diurnal swing. So it cools down at nighttime, always below 70 degrees, even if it's super hot. And then also, like again, the psychometric chart, you see there is no dots up here, so no humidity. It's a real dry desert climate. So look a little bit at wind. This was a model, a picture of the model the architects did. The idea is to have two-story classroom buildings connected with an outdoor circulation. That's the basic idea. And this was the final uh, scheme for the building. We wanted to do a naturally ventilated building without any air conditioning. And the building is paid by the parent association of this school. It needed to be a real low budget structure. The French government that paid for the land and for the design, but the construction was completely paid by the parent. And actually the parents came and said, we don't want to have air conditioning. Air conditioning makes our kids sick. So that was their take and we said, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Let's try it. The, the mechanical engineer from the Lebanon, he said, I don't care what you guys do. As soon as you are gone, I put in split units. So <laughs> that was his take. <laughs> but what we did is we said, let, let me jump to summer. This was winter day. So this is summer day. In summer, we have pipes embedded in the ground slab, like uh, six inch thick pipes. And we draw air through these pipes. And then half of the pipes, we collect and supply it to the bottom classroom and then we exhaust through this solar chimney to the outside. The other half of the pipes, we collect and bring it to the upper classroom, and then we exhaust through the other half of the solar chimney. Then in between the classroom buildings, we try to create this uh, courtyard situation where we put in a fabric and some trees uh, to provide some microclimate, nicer microclimate conditions. So, and then at nighttime, these solar chimneys are facing west, so we get the low sun angles. This is a masonry wall, black painted masonry wall. The idea is that we absorb all the heat from the sun during sunset, and so that we keep the stack effect running at nighttime and regenerate the, the ground slab with the cold air at nighttime. So same ventilation principle but we keep it running to, to, to provide, to cool down the entire thermal mass of the building. This is a rendering. This are, these are pictures I did when I was there. It was unfortunately a cloudy day, but you see all the chimneys, and they're all covered with polycarbonate. It's all really cheap, low budget, this elevated roof to keep the heat away from the roof of the building. And then you see here the courtyard, here the wires where they run the fabric. It's nothing motorized. They pull the, uh, the fabric over these uh, wires, probably in April or May, and then it stays shaded until September, October before they pull it back. The trees don't provide much shade yet, so, but it's gonna come. And then here you see the grill for the air intake the air that goes into these pipes. This is an image a professional photographer made here. A little better than my images, my pictures. Then at nighttime, but again, you see the fabric providing shade to these courtyards. And they don't even, sh they don't only shade the courtyard, they also shade the windows which are in these facades. I tend to show this when we work here in the west of the US, because it's a dry climate and it shows the potential one has in a dry climate. And when we, we did the project for Phoenix, for ASU, uh, 
And when we, the, the, the client was really scared when the architects brought us on the team because he said like Transolar is gonna, our budget is gonna explode. And we tried to explain him that it's, if it explodes, it's not because of us, it's because of him. Like you can do really low budget buildings which are extremely efficient, but there is no backup switch, there is no backup air conditioning. So if they feel too hot, there is no switch where they can say, now I wanna have 72 degrees. Which client in the US is ready for something like this? I think that's the point. So we start to double passive and active systems and build in mock, uh, backups and safety factors for all kinds of conditions. In Phoenix, we needed to study what climate change is gonna create within Phoenix so that we take it into account when we oversize the mechanical systems. This is basically what happens. It's always about oversizing. In the US, never ever a mechanical engineer got sued for oversizing a mechanical system. No, it's true, it can happen in Germany because he is wasting his client's money. When we did Harvard together, we finally convinced Harvard that we do 79 degrees, that we design mechanical systems to 79 degrees in summer peak conditions in the offices. And the, the mechanical engineer who was really good, we, we said, no, as the clients agreed on 79, let's take out equipment. We don't need it anymore. We did the modeling that proved that we don't need the equipment. And he said, but why don't we keep the equipment? They don't need to operate it. Huh? We can keep it, let's keep it. He said, the researchers are gonna come, they complain because they won't be happy with 79. And we said to him, if we keep the equipment, they're gonna operate it. The client told us 79, we have to take him serious. Unfortunately, we couldn't finish it. Now, finally, let me show you Bad Eibling. Do we have another? 10 minutes, five minutes, yeah. Uh, a project we did with, with, with Benish, it's a spa in Bavaria, was actually uh, David his project. And our, as David has mentioned, our relationship, we work with many architects worldwide, but our relationship to Benish is certainly very special. Not only that we are coming from the same area, the same city, uh, but we also have the same way how we approach and how we think about buildings. We are not architects. We are certainly approaching it from an engineering perspective. And we don't wanna pretend to be architects or designers. We wanna inform uh, design. We wanna help architects with the design of their buildings. But also we love cars, we love driving, and we love to pretend to be sustainable. <laughs> and we meet for smoking. So this is Bavaria, and it's really true. It's not, it's not just an image. This is how Bavaria is about, but only Bavaria. Like many Americans think all of Germany is like this. No, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, it's just Bavaria. <laughs> Benish won this competition with, this was the model from the competition. Uh, it's actually at the competition, it was a glass building with some domes where the swimming pools and sauna, etc., are inside the domes. And the, the client in the competition brief requested a cabin, cabinet spa. And I'm sure David is gonna talk much more about the cabinet spa uh, than I wanna do. But the idea was that these domes provide the cabinets with uh, some spa treatments while the glass box is basically a winter garden for people to relax. So this was a, bit, a very first scheme in the beginning. And we did some very simple modeling where we took a box and we said, now if we have a spa in a, a, like in a shoe box, a pool in a shoe box, in a glass shoe box, and we condition this and we compare this to an opaque insulated roof, and then we put the pool in a dome out of concrete, which is in a glass box, and we reverse it. How does the energy consumption look like? And it was interesting to see that it doesn't matter whether it's a glass building or insulated roof structure. The fact that we put it into a 
let's say, into a dome or separate the pool out of the environment provides us about 40% energy savings because suddenly we do not have all the humidity inside the entire building. We don't need to blow air on all glass facades to keep it uh, free from condensation. We don't need to vent this 24-7 so that we don't get condensation everywhere. Suddenly it relaxes the operation of the entire building to an extent that we save these 40%. So this was the starting point. And then <coughs> we, this was the scheme for the concept. What we said is we exhaust from the dome, we supply air into the winter garden, we call it the winter garden, and then air moves into the dome where we exhaust it and then goes into the air handling unit where we have the air, the heat recovery, etc. We did some modeling because how big does the opening need to be so that we don't get too much humidity going into the winter garden, but at the same time not creating too high uh, air velocity so that people feel uncomfortable. But let me jump over this. We found a good compromise, and this is now how it looks like. This is, these are the domes, and we did a lot of daylight modeling because there was the big discussion of how much glass do we really need and this is how we started and actually from an energy perspective you can do a glazy or a highly glazed uh, spa because a spa is heated you have inside a spa about 90 degrees so you heat it all year long and so whenever you have sun you can really use it but at the same time it tends to overheat, it makes the operation really complex. If sun comes out, you need to open flaps. The flaps are need to be designed so that you don't get draft where people are, etc., etc. It makes it really difficult and complicated and expensive. So we started to work on how much glass do we really need, and we did some daylight modeling. This was the daylight. I make it a little faster. We did many modeling, a lot of modeling. This was the fully glazed spa. <coughs> And we got so much sun or so much light inside that you basically need sunglasses to be there. Then we started, we tried to use uh, frosted glass, but it didn't change that much. And then over time we started to discuss uh, where should we uh, provide uh, opaque areas. So we don't need any glass along, along the perimeter because there we get daylight from the vertical facade. And so we put in, we started to sprinkler in opaque fields and still had a lot of daylight. And these were all modeling results during the process. And I think this is also what we really like to do. It's not coming up with an idea in a competition. We do lots of competition together. It's probably two competitions a month or so sometimes. <laughs> But it's not that there is an idea, you win the competition, and this is what it is. It's an, a, a building design is an evolutionary process. It changes over the course of the design process. And this was then in DD. This was, again, the daylight model. And we still have tons of light. And we always, like whenever we changed, we did the model. And then finally, we took the physical model and put it into this artificial sky, we call it, which is at the uh, university in Stuttgart. This is Stefan, isn't it? Yeah. Like testing on how, on how much light do we really get. And this was during the process. We started with 100% class in the beginning. And during the process, we got it down to how much do we have at the end? Something like 8% glass we have in the roof. And like the project manager from Danish, Robert Hülke, when the building was finished, he, went, he came back from the site and he said, as I walked through, I thought we still have too much glass. <laughs> this is how it looks like now. And here are some impressions of the various uh, spa treatment areas, the sauna, and then this is how the space looks inside. 
and you, s you see it's still a very bright environment, bright daylit environment. This is my final slide, to, which is the proof of global warming, <laughs> which is our motivation. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
And so, oh, <laughs> have a good night. <laughs> good night, John boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then this, this corridor is connected to a courtyard and we draw air from the courtyard into this double facade corridor and now people, when they open their window, they tap into this air being disconnected from the noise from the street. But this is a very specific case in Hanover at this very specific location. I would say, like, over in the 90s, when they did a lot of buildings in Berlin, double facade became hip. Everybody liked it. And everybody wanted to do a double facade. And many of these double facades have no reason. And many of them don't re work really well. And then there came people and said, all double facades are stupid. Yeah. And it's always these ups and downs. And I think if there is a good reason, and Winnipeg, giving people the ability to have operable windows, having the shade outside the conditioned environment, and there were an, a couple of other minor reasons, dealing with cold bridges in this climate, et cetera. That was enough reason, added value for the people to do a double facade. The same in Frankfurt with the high-rise buildings. But I think we would never be dogmatic about using double facade. I, th I think the double facade is always the second best solution. If we find a good working facade that doesn't need a second, it's better. Okay. <laughs> They probably did the vernacular, uh, the, the, the wind catchers because they didn't know of the solar chimneys <laughs> at the time. No, Damascus actually has no wind catchers. Wind catchers, at least I didn't find anyone, any wind catcher in Damascus. Wind catchers are always used where they have really reliable wind directions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there were always there are always many reasons. Like, uh, but the in in many buildings they used the wind catcher as you explained it, and then missed it to provide evaporative cooling, and then created air, create air movement often over this water surface, and then create a really nice microclimate in this courtyard. Here in this, we used the chimney to vent the building, not so much the courtyard. It was not about the courtyard. We wanted to use it as a driver for ventilation in the building. And there we thought that the sun is more reliable to us than the wind. And actually, it's always a combination, because by having these chimneys exposed to into the wind, you also create an under pressure at the top of the chimney. It's always a combination of wind and solar-driven ventilation. But the main focus was the ventilation of the building and not the ventilation of the courtyard. I think that was the biggest difference. And then the other thing was... The wind catcher bring the air through the floor space. And yeah. The, 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 the courtyard pulls the air out. I think it's just that it's very interesting to use the, you know, like the, the vernacular, the precedent, but yeah. to tweak it differently. And I was wondering, was there some reason also aesthetic, which is, I think, a reason, good reason as well to do something. But I think one of the biggest reasons we didn't want to use any kind of evaporative cooling was that, y let's say, there are always hygienic issues. And in the school, they have no maintenance staff. 
not only that they have a lack of water in this region, but we were mainly concerned about mold growth and having nobody that really looks after these water features and maintains it. That was the biggest reason why we didn't want to do any spray nozzles. And that makes then a wind catcher difficult because suddenly you get a lot of hot air into your courtyard, more than you want. So, but again, it's always a combination. And aesthetics was certainly also a big driver. I think this is the biggest uh, contemporary problem in, in architecture we need to face. And like I was reading somewhere that in China, they are planning to move 150 million people into the cities over the next 10 years. So they build, they intend to build twice Germany over the next 10 years. This is enormous, like the scale of this is just scary. And, and people don't really think about many of these issues. Even though I have to say there's a lot of discussion, a lot of good discussions go happening, start to happen in China, but I'm concerned that they're happening fast enough. And this is a big concern. And when we work together in Toronto on this lower down urban development, we talked the, we talked the waterfront Toronto into a carbon neutral development. And they were, in the beginning, they said, like, we don't believe that we, can't, that we can afford this. And what we said is, like, if anybody is doing an urban development today, there needs to be a roadmap of how this can achieve to be carbon neutral. It doesn't mean that the first building needs to be carbon neutral. But when you design a city, there is the beauty of scale. There are suddenly synergies in between the loads of different buildings. There suddenly you have such a big scale that you can use other technologies but then everything needs to be set up. You need to have the infrastructure, the systems, the buildings, like this interdependency of scale, need to be thought through to the very end so that you don't do anything at the beginning that creates a big problem at the end. And I think this is what they started to understand and start to like it and supported it. And I think this is what needs to happen. And then, and then the microclimate in a city become one of the issues as well, as well as the, I think the, all, all these social sustainability issues we never talked about, but like the programmatic mix of a city, all, all these aspects need to fall in place and create a logic for, like as I mentioned, this, this roadmap. And I, I think there are many people who start to be aware of these things, who drives it, like the city of Chicago puts a lot of thinking into this, even the city of Los Angeles. And uh, Portland, of course, uh, anyway, Oregon, the northwest of the US is the driver for all of this. And the, in, in Toronto, there came a group into, that uh, came into the game, which is, called, which is from Clinton, it's called Clim Clinton Climate Initiative. They support something like almost 20 urban developments worldwide with the idea to have a climate, what they call it climate plus or climate, climate negative, basically climate neutral, uh, CO2 neutral, CO2 neutral uh, developments. And the other one, there's only two, there are only two in North America. The one is in uh, Toronto, the other one is actually in Portland. So there are things happening, of course not fast enough, but I don't know. It may be necessary to do one circle with many mistakes so that when the city becomes, these cities becomes redeveloped, 
then they, this might be the chance to do it right. Did, did this answer your question? Yeah. Which is a good question because, <coughs> like, like Master, Master is very unusual, but they also wanted to build this in five years. Now it's on hold. But the, if somebody wants to build a city in five years, you know, it, it first basically needs to be planned. But if you do a city uh, like you usually do it over the course of a century or two centuries, can we really predict what are the requirements within 10 years, in 15 years? Like in 2000, when we had this. IT wave everywhere. There was a huge demand suddenly in every city for office space. Suddenly it collapsed, there was no demand. Right now there is a big housing demand downtown. People want to move downtown again. Can we really predict what the demand is in 10 years from now? What are the technologies, the materials, the planning tools? So what I'm, I'm doing something at the ESA in Paris this term where we try with students to develop and I think it's just a try. I'm not convinced that's the right thing to do. But I think instead of urban development, we should think about rules. We should think about process. How can we establish a process that provides rules, that gives us enough room to adjust in urban development based on needs at the specific time? I, I don't know if there is any good example. What we use, what we want to do in Paris is called uh, uh, cellular cellular automata. So you have a you have a cell, and you apply rules to the cell depending on the on the activity of the cells surrounding your cell. So we want to apply all these rules about shading, about wind, about social sustainability, to to create an automated urban development. And somebody can change the rules like you can start to build it and then if boundary condition change, you change the rule and the, the, it creates a new urban development for the rest of the city. I think for, for us it's like a test to how far we can come with this. I don't believe, like, I still think that in design the human factor is the most important thing.